would like, uh, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Real Estate Realities with the Rebel Broker. My name's Robert Whitelaw, and I am the Rebel Broker. Licensed real estate broker in the state of California, member of the National Association of Real Tours. But please, don't hold that against me. Welcome to another fabulous show, folks. Today's Wednesday. I hope all of you enjoyed the interview with Dean uh, Sukas yesterday. Um, actually talked to him, uh, I think it was Friday. And it was the first of the new system that I talked about a couple of weeks ago uh, where folks are able to schedule uh, their interviews. The, the system's working out very well. I'm very excited about the response. Very excited about some of the guests we have coming up. Uh, and Dean, I thought, was a great place to start because he, he was, you know, he gave us a perspective from a different angle, right? Now, he's a guy who came from a family of real estate people. Uh, so he, he kind of had a kind of had it in his blood, I guess you could say. Um but the insights of someone who had that kind of as part of their life for so long, I think is great for those of us maybe who didn't to understand the things we need to grapple with that we may have as habits that we might need to modify one direction or another uh, to uh, to really get the full potential out of what we're doing. His developer experience was interesting. Uh, I hope it was I hope it was valuable for all of you to get that perspective. And of course, uh, Magilla loans is I think a great way to go. I'm all about keeping control of your personal data. And I think that that's a a great way to do it. So I hope it was valuable for everyone. We'll have more like that. So stay tuned. We'll be getting all kinds of great insights from folks who are out there getting it done every day. Now, of course, what's first and foremost on our mind is what will we chat about today? Before we jump into that, let me remind everyone about how to get in contact. The best way is to head to the website at therebelbroker.com. Click on contacts in the menu bar and you can send along any ideas, suggestions, observations, or questions that you might have. While you're there, why not take the survey to support the show? To do that, scroll to the top of the page, click the big red button that says take the survey to support the show. Not only will you be helping the show, which is great and fantastic and I appreciate it, but I want to demonstrate my appreciation by giving a $50 Amazon gift card gift card to one of the folks who completes the survey. Now, when you take the survey, you'll be asked your email address two times. Make sure to use the same email address both times and you are in. So the next time we do the drawing for that $50 Amazon gift card, which we tend to do once a month, you will be in the mix. And it doesn't matter when you put your name in, whether you put it in six months ago or a year ago, or you put it in today, you uh, are up for the drawing. So so they, they, I've had a couple of people ask and know you're not just in the drawing for the month in which you went to the trouble of, of doing the, the survey. You are in there forever. Uh, so clearly doing it sooner is better than doing it later because each month the number of folks who've completed the survey increases. So the odds of you winning get less get less likely, right? It's more it's more likely now than it will be, say, in a month. So jump in there, get in there now so that you might find yourself 50 bucks richer in Amazon bucks. Um, other, there's only, there's like a, a weird thing, obviously, to discuss today. I, I often will can look at what's going on with the show in terms of milestones. Uh, in ter- we one milestone, and I pick weird milestones. I, I admit it. I, I I don't apologize for that. I I do sometimes get a little embarrassed by them. But one of the first ones was just suddenly everyone wants to hack my websites, right? Uh, so that w- and I don't even know if that has to do with the show. I guess I assumed it had to do with the show. It was because it was only happening actually to the to the show site uh, predominantly. There's the normal low level of hum of people trying to hack sites in general. But I got to this point where it was at a certain point, I got to the point where I had a certain number of downloads per month that I had been shooting for. Well, now, and I've told you about what great interactions I've had with members of the audience. Where I've said both, all of them are positive. And today, I had the looniest of loonies uh, call me and to chat about just all kinds of things. Um, 
that, uh, you know, at first I got into the, all right, I need to correct this person mode. I, I thought, you know what I need to, I need to really try to talk this person down from the crazy tree. They were talking about all kinds of crazy stuff. And it was, there was a lot of discussions about immigration and Trump and real estate and all how these things all intersected in terms that I think by and large, uh, most of us would agree that, that the conversation really needs to turn away from that or, or needs to stop. Uh, and I wanted to sort of like voice it. And I thought to myself, you know what, this, maybe this lady, lady just needs to get this stuff off of her chest. So I just let it ride and, uh, and, and kind of thanked her for calling. Um, and that was, that was it. But I considered that another mile. It's another checkbox on the list. You always hear about, you know, I, I guess on some level, I aspire to be one of those like well-known podcast guys or one of those well-known show guys. And, uh, you always hear the stories, right? You hear about the people who, I guess the next thing would be a death threat. I, I mean, I'm not soliciting for one. Thank you. Um, that actually, eh, that might freak me out a little bit. Uh, but anyway, just, just another thing to check off on the checklist. Uh, we have some, um, a couple of weird things and, and, and things that uh, really jump out at me as duh moments, right? So let, let's hit it. Let's, let's go with duh moment number one for today. And I, and I, you know, maybe I need to make this a regular segment. Maybe I need to have like the pinhead story of the day or the zippy story of the day or the idiot story of the day. Um, but this one is not only news that that even by itself is important to know, right? Because sometimes knowing why something is the way it is is less important than knowing that it is, right? Because you're going to base your future decisions on it. There's nothing you can do about the stuff that led up to it other than watch out for it and try to minimize it as you move forward. But we're in the we're we're in the take the temperature business, right? We want to know what the temperature is right now, but we also want to f- try to figure out where that's going to go. And, and what does that new temperature mean we should do? as investors, right? And now if you're a frog where someone is slowly increasing the temperature of the water you're in, if you don't pay attention, you end up as a cooked frog. So let's not be the, boy, man, my analogy, I am way calibrated into the weird zone on my analogies today. And I, maybe I should just stop. Maybe I should just stop doing it. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into this first one. I actually think this is pretty fertile ground uh, because it, 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 it definitely validates things we've talked about and it fits in perfectly with what we've talked about in terms of lending. What's going on with lending? We talked about how we're about to be embracing the 120% loan for those folks who roll their student loan debt, which is a huge bubble, by the way. We've already talked about how crazy that one is. And I guess some people could say, well, wait, you know, Rebel, you're turning you're turning this huge bubble into something that's that's more manageable. I suppose that's one way to look at it. I don't think that's a correct way. Um, into something that's linked to a house, but at 120 percent of the value of the home. Remember, regardless of of how that extra amount of debt got tacked onto that mortgage, it's still just linked to a house. So when someone looks at their statement, they see themselves underwater by this amount. And that's got that's going to sting, and you're going to see people reacting the same way people did last time they were in that situation. But they're going to start off in this "I'm ridiculously underwater" scenario before there's any kind of a market thing. We're, it's like jump starting. <laughs> it's like jump starting the the panic, right? The, the, when when things started to go even slightly wrong, and folks saw they were so ridiculously underwater, people started walking away from loans. People started. Uh, going, trying to buy another house at the new lower price because prices went down and then just walking away from the first loan after they got that second home. Um, so there's there's that, right? There's that angle of it. There is the angle of where we're seeing 1%, 2%, 3%, 3.5% down loans. Again, all loans that end up being in negative equity, right? Because it would cost you more once you got the home sold and pay all the costs of selling the property, the seller would have to pay money to get the home sold. And then the other thing we talked about, uh, how credit ratings are being jerked around. They're being m- manipulated to allow people who aren't good credit risks to appear to have higher credit scores, right? 
Before, when we did this and screwed up, we just ignored low credit scores and called you a subprime borrower. Now, we're simply trying to avoid that label of being a subprime borrower by freaking out the the way that this thing is calculated so that people who would normally be considered subprime score higher on their credit scores. All these various things, all things we've talked about. Go back and check out previous shows. I'll see if I can't dig up some links to previous shows that really got into the details of this and include it in the show notes for today's show. Now, for those of you who are new to the show, remember, we always have show notes associated with this show, which means if you go to the rebelbroker.com, you can check out the show notes and see links to the articles that we're talking about. And, and I usually try to toss in a link to a previous show that relates in some way. Uh, not all the time, but but a, a huge amount of time I, I do that. So it's a good way for you also to discover shows that you may have missed. So make sure to check that out. Uh, But here's the headline. And this is from CoreLogic being reported by HousingWire. The headline is, mortgage lending becomes riskier in the first quarter of 2017. And and they follow it up. You know how they have kind of had the sub headline on a lot of these stories? Risk levels similar to early 2000s. Well, hold on a second. We haven't even gotten into the story, and they're already drawing parallels to the 2000s. Well, who else did that for you eight months ago? This guy. Um, We are doing the exact same goofy crap from from the early 2000s. That should not comfort anyone. Now, I know there are still people out there who like to say, boy, I sure do wish we could return to the pre downturn uh, real estate market. It was so great. You know, we had tons of homes. Homes were going up in value, yada, yada. That is not the mindset you should have. Because remember, from about 1999 up until 2007 was the run-up of stupidity of subprime lending. It was bad. It was like being on the deck of the Titanic at a, at, at, at a point when you couldn't turn away from the, from the iceberg, right? Not good. You should not pine for those days. You should look at those days and try to learn the lessons of how absolutely stupid it was to do what we did in the early 2000s. And stuff I've been spouting now for close to a year, over half a year, is exactly that. All of these things that we're doing feel very familiar because even though we're we're getting to this result in a slightly different way, it's the same result. We are putting hands into people who, into the hands of people who aren't financially mature enough to handle it, as measured by credit ratings and credit history and all that other kind of wonderful stuff. All right. The first sentence says it all, really, that mortgages became more risky in the first quarter of 2017, according to the quarter one 2017 CoreLogic Housing Credit Index. Um. The index from CoreLogic, a property information analytics and data-enabled solutions provider, measures trends in six-month mortgage credit risk attributes. The HCI indicates the increase or decrease in credit risk for new home originations compared to the period before. These six attributes include borrower credit score, debt-to-income ratio, loan-to-value ratio, investor-owned status, condo co-op share, co-op share, and documentation. All right, so according to this article, beginning in the first quarter of 2017, the HCI uh, was revised to include a more comprehensive source of loan-level, non-agency, mortgage-backed securities data. Now, it might be worth taking a second to talk a little bit about mortgage-backed securities, because remember, the one word that you probably heard a lot during the last downturn was securitization. One of the things that really drove things crazy was suddenly... These these securitized loans, which basically means you take tons of different mortgages, you bundle them together, and then you let people invest in them. And by people, I mean their securities that are being traded, that are being invested in in the stock market, which means pensions, retirement funds, 401ks. That's the depth of reach that these things have when it comes to these things not going well. Right. So you may say to yourself, I don't need to worry about what happens with these securitized securitized loans. I do not care because I don't invest in them. Yeah, well, you probably do. And you don't even know it. If your 401k is investing in various things uh, and sometimes it won't even say real estate security, sometimes it'll simply say a securities package of some kind. And as part of that package, those those securitized mortgages are going to be in there. 
But let's say you do go to the trouble of saying, I don't want to have any part of these securitized loans. Sorry, when they get hit and take a dump, they take other things with them that aren't even in real estate. Uh, It could be different retail style things, all kinds of different stuff. So yeah, no matter what your money is in, it's going to get negatively affected by these things when they go boom. Now think about what we've talked about just in the last few minutes. You don't even need to go back to some of the shows where we've gotten into nauseating detail on some of these different credit things. These... um, these securitized loans will be bundled frequently into, into groups based on certain similar attributes. So you can bet that these 120% loans are going to get bundled together. You can bet that uh, – and, and they're all based on risk, right? So the rate of return is, 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 is mixed one way or the other based on some of these risks you're willing to take. Uh, but then you can get ones that are fully just mixed, just random selections of different styles of mortgages or, or whatever. You can get ones that are just based on fixed rate mortgages. You can get ones based just on variable rate mortgages. Um, they, they can be bundled together in a lot of different ways. Okay. Um, mortgage back security. The result is that the HCI more accurately captures the loans that exhibited higher risk features during the mid 2000s. Quote, overall credit risk for purchase loans was slightly higher compared with a year ago as the investor share and condo co-op share increased. These increases offset low risk signals from the credit score, DTI and LTV, uh, loan to value, attributes to result in an uptick in overall riskiness. Still, overall risk is similar to that of the early 2000s. Um, now, they say they like, like it's an okay thing, but it, it, it you should be worried. Um Let's see here. There's really nothing else here that's particularly sexy in terms of this. But the takeaway is the level of riskiness associated with mortgages is now on par with what we were seeing in the early 2000s. And remember, while nothing bad happened in those early 2000s, those all fed the fires that brought us to 2007 and 2008. This is not good news. Don't let anyone tell you different. You will find some people try to spin this as okay news. It is not. All right, we're going to go ahead and take a quick break here for a second. uh, But don't go away. We'll be right back with more on the wide, wonderful world of real estate. So stay right where you are. Are you ready to jump in and start your search for your first investment property? Maybe you've decided that it's time to own your own home. Or maybe you're ready to sell your home and move on to something new. No matter what your goal is, the Rebel Broker can help. That's right. Aside from hosting this show, I am also the owner broker of White Lawn Sons Real Estate Services right here in Silicon Valley. With over 25 years experience serving Silicon Valley, Morgan Hill, San Martin, and Gilroy, I or one of my great agents can help you achieve your goals in real estate. So if you're ready to look into taking that next step towards achieving your real estate goals, point your browser at www.soldbyrobert.com. That's www.soldbyrobert.com robert.com and get in touch. Let me show you how I will earn your business and your respect. Again, that's www.soldbyrobert.com or you can call me at 408-852-0525. California Bureau of Real Estate ID 00984909. Welcome back everyone. I tell you that that story on on uh, riskiness and mortgages really it's just one more brick in that wall we've been building but it's absolutely got to concern you um i I, i'm these these indicators are are all pointing in directions that actually scare me a little bit so we'll see how you feel about it we'll continue to keep an eye on it and see how it goes but for now let's jump off of that crazy train and off to another as you know one of the communities i like to keep an eye on is phoenix uh, it, it and, and here's why, right? So, so many of these communities are interesting to me because of how they performed in the last downturn. Did they tend to, to d- decline early? Were they later decliners? Uh, what you know? So, can we treat them as communities that might give us a heads up into what's likely down the road in terms of what's going to happen? Now, as this article from Calculated Risk points out, it's a key housing market to follow. Since it saw a large bubble and bust followed by strong investor buying. Uh, and there's a few tidbits of data here that I think are interesting. And again, it's, the things you need to keep in mind are simply inventory thoughts. Um, and I, you know, we're, we're going to chat about this one in a, in a, in a minute, but 
I, I honestly think that there are ways to manage this, but they, they become problems that uh, may be too much for some folks to take on. But anyway, well, let's start off here with overall sales in May were up 9.3% year over year, but the active inventory was down by more. It was down by 9.5% year over year. So clearly what we've got is the dynamic we have seen that has fed this insane market where prices are going up not because of a of 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 what you might call more market related things although that's not really fair inventory is clearly part of the market but it's an inventory driven increase is what i'm getting at there's a singular reason why why these prices continue to go up uh, and inventory is absolutely a controllable thing. Uh, if builders build, inventory goes up, which satisfies demand, which reduces prices or at least stabilizes them. Now, even in this market, we are not talking about prices declining. We're talking about the amount they increased declining. So in other words, if prices were up 6.3%, in 2015, for instance, which they were. They were up 6.3%. In 2016, prices were up only 4.8% from the previous year. So it's not about prices going down. It's It's about the amount of additional money, the rate at which those prices go up simply slowing. Now, this is the seventh consecutive month with year over year decreases in inventory. And prices are up 1.7% 1.7% through March with a 7.1% annual increase. So there you go. That's the lay of the land. Uh, we've And also, if you take a look at things like the percent of transactions that were cash, uh, we've seen a steady decrease. So at the peak, we saw that number sticking at 46.3, and that was in 2012. Uh, then we saw it drop to 38.9, then to 29.5, then to 24, then to 21.9. And my guess is in May of 2017, once they calculate that, we'll have that number be uh, maybe even below 20%, which would which would continue the, the, the sort of general trend that we've seen over the last few years. And that should spell the same thing to you that it spells to me, that it is not as much an investment market as it once was. You may not want to look at it from that standpoint. Does that mean you shouldn't shop in Phoenix? No. I think I think you apply the same market analysis strategies that we've talked about here. You may still be able to find some excellent deals. But let me, let me go a little bit in a sidestep of this. That may annoy some of you, and I apologize. But I'm trying to figure out here, because when I did the math, and I've done the math several times since, when faced with this, with this inventory thing, well, what do you do? If you're someone who needs or wants to buy in a specific area that's experiencing this, what do you do? And the the first thing I jumped to was, there were two things. One was unconventional properties, properties that tend to not get searched for. That could be, uh, you know, two bedroom homes with one bath is is a frequent thing. Uh, that tends to get searched for a lot less than three bedrooms. And my argument when I first talked about this strategy was to blend that with a two bedroom home with one bath that has a slightly larger lot than normal so that you are able to add on to that home and make it more acceptable for the, what the market demands today, which would mean uh, at least two bedrooms and three baths, right? In terms of desirability, if you're someone who's going to do something like that as a flip. Now, in the math that I did on that, and you'd have to do this for your own market area, indicated if I were to do that and go to the expense of doing it, including estimating the cost for permits and everything else, I would, in making that change, I would net out or I would increase the value by that property enough so that I would be able to pocket, after all expenses, about 85000 bucks in the market in which I was looking at. Uh, simply because the level of demand jumps, the number of people who are going to make offers goes up, and, and, that's, and, and, and that's just kind of the way that that, that market was working. So that's, that's solution number one, finding, doing searches that uh, are less frequent and trying to draw from that supply of properties to achieve your goal. Uh, and if and if you can, if you can find ones where there's one and a half baths, at least in my area, this may not be true in all counties, but in my area, adding a toilet is much more expensive uh, than adding bathtubs or sinks, right? In in my area, a bathroom equals a room with a toilet in it. So 
And a lot of times the way the county is calculating things, it makes it more expensive for you to add a, a toilet. I'm not sure why. This is what my contractors tell me. Maybe they've been lying to me, but that's what I hear. And I've had clients who've come back and said, yeah, it cost me, it cost me too much to get a permit to add a bathroom. Uh, but in any event, if you can find something with two and a half, it's really easy to convert a half bath into a full bath. Uh, it's less, there's less involved. Adding that toilet isn't part of that process. So it makes it easier for you. So if you can find the absolute perfect combination would be one or two bedrooms with one and a half baths. That That's the sweet spot in terms of finding properties. And of course, it would need to have enough land associated with it for you to make improvements uh, to, to give it those extra rooms and to expand that bathroom. Okay, so that was number. That was one of the first things that I jump into, and it's something I've exercised. And it's actually a technique I've used with clients who wanted to spend a whole lot less and have a bit a, a more rewarding back end to the deal. And there was a, a great one I can remember from downtown Morgan Hill, where this it fit the it fit the criteria perfectly. It was two bedrooms where one of the bedrooms was micro sized. I mean, you could barely fit a bed in it. So it was just, it was for all intents and purposes, purposes, a one bedroom and nobody wanted it. And it had one and a half baths, but it had a slightly oversized lot. And sure enough, this person purchased that home, remodeled it, uh, added enough square footage so they could have three bedrooms that were all bedrooms of reasonable size. And it had two baths. And, 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 and what's interesting about that two bedroom was the, uh, none of the bathrooms were part of the master bedroom. And in fact, there was no real master bedroom. Uh, so you had to go out and there was a hallway bath, and then at the very front of the house, uh, there was this bizarrely little placed partial bath uh, that just had a that just just was a half bath. Okay, anyway, so that's what you're looking for. Um, the other thing is also properties that are, have been languishing on the market for a really long time, and you can do this simply by sorting by days on market. Go look at them, and you'll probably find that the layout of the house is ridiculously lame for some reason, uh, or that it has some other thing holding it back. Now, depending on what's if it's something you can change that's holding it back, the same theory will apply. You can do work on it to make it more desirable. But here's the other thing, and this is something I've mentioned in the past, including stuff I was trying to do. I couldn't make it happen because I had a my list of requirements for this lot was a little bit more restrictive than I think some people could do. Uh, if I was doing it strictly as a place for me to live, my criteria would have been different. But my criteria had to do with uh, future desirability as an investment, and for renters and making sure that I'd, I'd be rented 100% of the time. So there were a lot of different elements in there that needed to be part of it. I absolutely did not want a septic tank. I didn't want a well, so I couldn't do that. But I wouldn't mind those things in a home where I'm just going to live there, right? Okay, so why am I bringing this up? Create your own inventory. If inventory is letting you down, go find yourself a lot Figure out what you're willing to tolerate, like I did. And if you've got a very restrictive list, it's going to take you much longer to find the right property. But be ready to purchase that property and do it in a way that makes sense to you and get all of your financing lined up. You could head on over to mcgilloloans.com. They actually have a place for you to go to get a loan for buying land and building a house. It, it, I don't know any place else that does that. Quicken Loans doesn't do that. Nobody else does that. Uh, and of course, when I first went through it, I got referred to a loan guy in San Diego that works very closely with a, uh, a home manufacturing company uh, that's like in Bakersfield or something. So that was how I found my guy. But get all that stuff pre-approved, figure out what you need to do, figure out what your limits are in terms of purchasing the lot and what's required. And if you can find one that's a an all-encompassing loan, meaning you get approved once, and once the process is over, you have a standard mortgage, that's the best way to go. Um, you may not be able to do that. There may be other there may be other options that fit better with you. But the reality is uh, you can go and find yourself a, a lot that will work perfectly for you. Then get yourself connected with someone that can provide you with a modular home or factory-built housing is what we call it in California. It's not a manufactured home. Manufactured homes are more in line with trailers or mobile homes and actually have to be listed as a separate category of home. When you build a uh, factory-built home or a modular home, once it is built, it is a single-family residential home. It has no special designation or anything that differentiates it from any other property. And in fact, I have been in these 
types of homes that were built in this way. And once they're built, you cannot tell the difference between uh, a stick built home where they just built it right there on the lot and a prefab or factory built home. And in fact, the uh, the quality of construction, the uh, fit and finish of the home, I have found in modular homes or factory built homes to be better but you end up saving money. So once you've done it, and the math, every single time I've run the math, in terms of acquiring a a piece of land, and if necessary, digging the well, and getting power from the street to the to the pro, to the house, uh, digging a well, getting a septic system installed, all of that stuff, run it all down. I end up with a home that is worth a ton more than what I paid, and that's great for a lot of reasons. One, it'll save you on taxes because it's 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 the it's based on what it costs. Uh, but also, if you're an investor, you can turn around and sell that thing and make yourself a deal. When I did the numbers the last time around, when I first started my search, and this was almost two years ago, um, I had found a couple of lots that looked promising. So I actually ran through all the numbers and found once it was all built, I could turn around and sell that home for anywhere between three hundred dollars and $400,000 more than what it cost me to acquire the lot, build the home, and, and get it all done. Um, so... That's a solution, and I. What's really great about a solution like that is you end up with this built-in equity. Where if property values do decline by a huge chunk of change, you're probably going to still find yourself in a position where you can sell it for more than you owe, uh, and that is a comforting thing uh, for folks that might be concerned about a downturn in the market. I think these are excellent solutions. Now, in terms of where the best places are to find lots. In my area, the best place is still going to be the MLS. In other words, working with a real estate agent. However, I've had a couple of people tell me they've had good luck with putting regular posts on places like Craigslist where they say, I want to buy land, and they post it every week. And they simply wait for people to call them. And sometimes they say it takes months, but they'll get a lead on a property where there's no real estate agent involved. It's just a private owner of a lot. They find out where it is. They go look at it. And, you know, a percentage of the time it's no good, but another percentage of the time it works out perfectly and they end up with a great deal. Uh, so I, I, even if this isn't your number one choice, but if you're finding yourself ridiculously frustrated with prices or you've looked at the market and said, God, you know, we're at the top of this market. Uh, I'm concerned that if I buy a house, I'm, I'm going to get hosed. Uh, do them both at the same time. There is no reason why you cannot do that. I continue to look for this type of property to work for me. Um, and if I find that, if I do end up discovering the, a, a property for sale or a lot for sale that will work and satisfy my criteria, I will sell this place in a heartbeat. I'll put a trailer on that lot and live there a little rough until that thing is done. And, and and when it's done, I'll have a great house and, and it'll be a great investment down the road when I finally move on from here. So, all right. So I hope that that's been helpful. You know, I, I, I'm trying to, to come up with these different aspects that you can introduce into your strategies, ways you can approach problems you're facing. Whenever you say, you know, I'm priced out of this market, it's just not going to work for me. I can't, I can't do it. But if, if you're in that situation where it, it needs to happen for you, Come up with other strategies, and there's a variety of ways you can do that. It could Another strategy we could talk about in a later show, which we've already covered in previous shows, is buying multifamily instead of single family. Uh, I'm finding that in terms of return, the numbers work awesome on multifamily. Um, duplex is good. Triplex and quad is better. Uh, so even though some of those numbers may sound scary, you know, imagine being able to purchase a quad where you're living in one and renting out three others where each one of them is making you say a thousand dollars a month. That's three thousand dollars towards your mortgage. And depending on how much you spent on that property, you're probably doing all right. And you've got a little diversification. So if one goes vacant for some period of time, you're not losing all of your investment money. You're not invest or all of the proceeds from rents. You're not losing 100% of it. You're losing one third. And then of course, when the time comes and you've banked up enough money and you buy another home for yourself, now you've got four rental units because you can rent the one that you are living in. Uh, and when I run those numbers, those those typically have the best cash flow. Then do the same in your own market. This we've we've walked through this process, so you can abs- absolutely do that as well. All right, folks. 
I think that's about it for today. I, I certainly hope that you have taken away far more in value than you've invested in time by listening to the show. Thanks for listening. I'll talk to you all next time.